Well, is there something you dread so much that, that the thought of it alone makes you want to do anything else, anything else at all? It's just me. I'm the only one who didn't want to do his homework first thing or who still kind of loves to leave the dishes soak in the sink. Well, you know the one, you know the, you know one household chore that gets me the most? It's getting our air conditioner down out of the attic crawl space. I hate it. I hate it with a passion. I think that I might wait through the summer. It's probably going to come down in August and go back up in February or something like that. Oh, it's, it's awful. We have one of these massive window air conditioners that, that fill the whole house or fill most of our upstairs. And uh, it's huge. So I, initially, I, I tried to install a pulley system so that we could pull it up into the, into the attic. I was really proud because I used multiple pulling, pulleys to try to relieve all the energy off of it. Um, but, but that didn't work so well. So I, I built a box out of plywood snugly fit around the air conditioner, and it's really not that stable, but it was the best that I could do. And I, I bought a winch from Harbor Freight and installed it up in the attic and so we could claw onto this thing. And, and that kind of works. I, my wife is up there running the controls, and I'm here kind of stabilizing it, but you have to be really careful because you don't want it to snag, otherwise that, that rickety box is just going to shatter into a million pieces and the air conditioner is going to fall on me. And there... There have been several times doing this that I have seen my life flash before my eyes. Now, I think that, then you're probably thinking, oh man, that must be scary. But you know, I hate putting that air conditioner up there so much that maybe that thing falling on me wouldn't be such a bad thing after all. What about you? What's the thing that you do over and over that you just get tired of, of doing, that you just don't really want to wake up in the morning, that chore that you don't want to wake up in the morning and do. Maybe it's, maybe it's something as simple as flossing. Or maybe it's something big, like winterizing the cabin for the season, for those of you who have cabins. It could it be that, that, that one of those things that's, that's hard to get out of bed for is attending church on a Sunday morning. Oh, the pastor said it. Sacrilege. How could he even raise the question. When I was 12 or 13, I had a big fight about, with my mom about the whole thing. And she said, you know, someday you're going to like it. I still remember that. I, none of us could anticipate that I would make a career out of it. <laughs> but can I take it one step further? Make it maybe just a little bit more personal. Attending a church service is, is certainly one thing, but what about worship? Worship. What about worship? And that may not connect immediately, especially we tend to think of worship as you know, singing songs together, or some people think of worship that way. And certainly that is an important and vital expression of, of worship in community. It's a great way to do something together and not just do something individually, like listen to a message or something like that. What I'm talking about is kind of the thing behind that. As I've processed it, I thought about it this way. Worship could be maybe roughly defined as a space, whether that's privately or publicly, for recognizing, appreciating, and expressing the greatness of God. Recognize, or recognizing, appreciating, and expressing the greatness of God. And maybe for some of you here, that's not something that you really think about. It's not really a bother for you. But it's also not necessarily on your top 10 list of things to do. Perhaps there are some of you here who have never really experienced that at all, at least from a kind of a heart level. That's not something that you've put energy into. The truth is, worshiping does not require a lot of effort. It's not like mowing the lawn. It's not like washing the dishes. But it is a move of the soul. It is a move of the soul. And sometimes in the morning, I don't know about you, but my head and my heart, they just aren't there. And I get up, and instead of saying, good morning, Lord, my heart says, good Lord, it 
it's morning, <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> and the timeless call to worship feels more like, really more like a chore. But let me take this even one step more. For some here, the idea that God calls a person to worship might even feel kind of antiquated in a world that is increasingly sensitive to power dynamics. Now, serving a God who, in some people's words, demands worship it might feel depressing. It might feel even demeaning or demanding. If worship or praise, remember that space where we recognize, appreciate, and express the greatness of God. If worship can be such a hard thing or can be a difficult thing for people to sometimes comprehend or even for some, a difficult thing to get behind. Why worship anyway? Why worship anyway? Now, full disclosure, when I, when I do a message, I don't really like to center it around a why question because why questions tend not to be very, very personal. And also one of Jesus' disciples, uh, James, he, he taught us that we're not only supposed to be hearers of the word, we're supposed to be doers of the word too. We sh what we learn should launch us into action. So I, I tend to, to shy away from the why questions, but I, but I think this is a why question that, that's actually kind of personal. It's actually, it's actually kind of personal. And the reason is this. Knowing our why behind worship makes worship real. It makes worship real. And on the, other, on the other side, on the other hand, alternatively, there's a cost if we don't. If we don't know our why for worship, when we go into worship, it can, it can create a disconnect. It can create discontent. It even maybe gives us the, creates the possibility that it would break our, our relationship and our, our connection and our desire to walk with God. So why worship anyway? Why worship anyway? That's the question that I want to explore with you today. And it just so it turns out that I don't think that we're the first person to ask that question hundreds of years before Jesus there was a psalmist, and I believe that he had this question on his heart as well. Uh, he understood, he knew that he should worship, he understood his obligation, but sometimes duty is not enough to get us out of bed. So let's jump into Psalm chapter 104. Praise the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are. You are magnificent. You are robed in splendor and majesty. He covers himself with light as if it were a garment. He, he stretches out the skies like a tent curtain and lays the beams of the upper rooms in his palace on the rain clouds. He makes the clouds his chariot and travels along on the wings of the wind. He makes the wind, it winds his messenger, his in the flaming fire, his attendant. He established the earth on its foundations. It will never be moved. The watery deep covered it like a garment. The, the waters reached above the mountains. Your shout made the waters retreat. At the sound of your thunderous voice, they hurried off. As the mountains rose up and, and the valleys went down to the place, for, place you appointed for them, you set up a boundary for them that they could not cross so that they would not cover the earth again. And now on the surface, the psalmist here doesn't seem to be struggling with praise. But I think early on, there's, there's a little bit of a hint 
otherwise in the opening line. The psalmist says, praise the Lord, but this is not just a, an expression of gratitude for him, nor is it a, an invitation for others to join with him in praise because of what he says next. He says, praise the Lord, O my soul. The psalmist is not just praising, he is talking himself into praising. Talking himself into praising. What follows is this majestic description of God, and the psalmist calls God magnificent. God covers himself with light. In light of the events of this weekend with the northern lights coming down, I, I know you were probably asleep like me, but I saw the pictures. <laughs> it's, it's timely, isn't it? To see God wrap himself with, with beauty, maybe beauty just like that. Well, the psalmist, he's just getting started. He goes on, he talks about big skies stretched out like a tent, buildings being assembled in the heavens above these heavenly, mysterious heavenly waters, chariots made out of clouds, winds his messengers. Then he moves to talk about the foundations of the earth, these deep oceans being set and given a boundary. Beyond what we've read here, he's gonna put a heavy emphasis on creation, and that's gonna continue. He, des he describes springs breaking out and being tamed and being made into streams where animals drink, streams that feed trees where, where birds go to live and, and sing, uh, streams that are, that are turned into wine and that and give humans the ability to make bread and produce gladness. God uses all of these things for good, and, and there's so much beauty. He's going to go on further to talk about the sun and the moon and the stars and how they, they govern the lives of, of human beings and even the king of the jungle, the lion. And then he'll, he'll go on further to talk about how big things, massive things that we can't even understand, like, like the ocean, are created for small creatures that live in it, and even humans that travel on ships in the ocean. A beautiful psalm describing a beautiful world. And beauty in the world can draw our attention to the beauty of the one who crafts it. But that's not exactly what the psalmist is talking about here. Not exactly. He's not just painting a picture. Did you notice? He's telling a story. God is God is building something here. After capturing the light, presumably the, the light of one of those heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, or whatever, or maybe all of them, he clothes himself with it. Then he starts laying a foundation for some kind of a building in the, in this heaven, above this heavenly ocean. After that, he, he gathers clouds together and he makes them into a chariot. He also gathers winds and makes them messengers. Messengers that in another place in the psalm are, are sent to destroy. He goes, he goes to earth to solidify the foundations and he shouts back the water for dry land and establishes a boundary so that people can use it. What's going on here? What's going on here? Well, there is a lot to unpack in this passage, a lot about the way that ancient people viewed the universe and how the Bible, while not affirming myth, often plays with myth, the myth of, myths of people, the peoples around them, often to make a point. As interesting and as valuable as it would be to go into that, just for the sake of time, we'll, 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 suffice, to, we'll suffice it to say, suffice it to say, that this is God's point, the point of the psalmist in this picture of creation. God is going to war. God is going to war. But war against what? War against what? Against creation? Well, to try to explain this, I just want to pause because I think we're going to have to recalibrate, recalibrate the way that we think about something. And I, I want to start with a prominent image in this psalm, and that's uh, one of the images is, is the image of water. Now, when we think of water, things that come to mind for us are, are things like the feeling of refreshment, 
the good feeling of our thirst, our thirst being quenched. Or sometimes during a baptism, we'll put a little water drop up. Even though when we baptize people here, it's really more like a giant splash. We put the water drop up, and, and that's, that's a symbolic image for us of, of cleansing, of purification. All of these are good things, and when we tend to think about water, we tend to think of good things, good feelings come to our mind. And the truth is, that was true in the ancient world, too. That was true for Hebrew peoples as well. They also had another image of water that was, I don't know, more chaotic and dark. Messy, unorganized, uncontrolled. And if we think about it from an ancient person's perspective, it kind of makes sense. The ocean is a very dangerous place, my friends, right? Imagine the disciples on the Sea of Galilee as a surprise gale force storm appears and suddenly they're not sure which way they're going or if they're even going to make it back. Or think of a a surprise flood going down one of the canyons um, somewhere in ancient Israel where it just takes out an entire herd of cattle. Water is refreshing. Water is good. It symbolizes purity even for the ancients. But water also symbolized chaos, sometimes darkness. You see it in the second verse of the Bible. The Spirit of God is hovering over the deep as if he's suppressing it, as if he's taking control over it, there is something chaotic happening. And sometimes this symbol went so far as to picture evil forces that God was holding at bay and keeping from people. One of my favorite verses in the Old Testament that probably depicts this in in a more clear way is in Job chapter 38. Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? Well, a little context. Job is complaining that God sent evil his way. And this is, this is God's response. Who shut up the sea behind the doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness? When I fixed limits for it? and set its doors and bars in place. When I said, this far you may come and no farther, here is where your proud walls, proud waves halt. Who said that? Who shut, them? who shut the sea behind the doors? Well, obviously it's God. He's the one who did this. You see, the sea here is picturing an evil, chaotic force, and God is shutting it away. Not only that, he's, he's wrapping it in garments, and the translation doesn't exactly picture what's going on, but he is using clouds, I'll put it this way, and he is, he is taking this water that has burst forth from the womb, and he is putting it in a diaper. Yeah. That's what this picture is. He's making it small, something that is powerful, fierce, and scary, uncontrollable. He's containing it, and he is making it small. What a great text for Mother's Day, right? (laughs) Diapers, and maybe not. Maybe not so much. Well, here's the point. In the opening verses of this translation, it says that God, God is magnificent, but the word can also mean strong. In the very act of creation, God shows, shows it by putting evil, uncontrollable forces at bay. Well, this psalm goes on. There's quite a few verses, and it, the main point comes later, so I'm going to summarize a few things before we get there. First, verses 10 through 18 describe how God not only puts the waters at bay, he repurposes them for good, as we talked about. He, he, makes, he makes springs and he turns them into to streams so that people can drink, so that animals can drink, so that there are trees for the birds to live in. And he, he uses it to make, make people glad through wine and bread that sustains them. 
And it's not just the water that he repurposes. He repurposes the, the elements in the sky, the sun and the moon, so that it governs the lives of human beings and it even gov governs the king of the jungle, the lion himself. In verses 23 through 30, the psalmist marvels at the many creatures that God has made and he turns, he turns his attention to the, the very big things that God has made for these little creatures. The sun, which this beast, the Leviathan, he talks about, plays in is given, the ocean is given for this beast to play in. And then he talks about humans on ships, that the ocean is given to human beings, small human beings for people to travel. Before closing, in verses 31 through 32, he puts a bow on all that all God is for creation by describing his splendor, his power, and glory, and capping it off with a prayer. May the Lord find pleasure in the living things he has made. May he find pleasure. He has put everything in its place. He has held back the forces that bring chaos and confusion so creatures can enjoy life and be glad. And the Lord himself looks at creation and takes pleasure in its enjoyment. But not everything, not everything enjoys that order. And this is where I think the psalmist kind of suggests or hints at his main point. Verse 33. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God as long as I exist. May my thoughts be pleasing to him. I will rejoice in the Lord. May sinners disappear from the earth and then the wicked vanish. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. I will sing, I will sing, may my thoughts, I will rejoice, praise the Lord, O my soul, praise the Lord. On a surface level, it seems like he's simply concluding with this magnificent triumph of the Lord's amazing work in creation. That's what it seems like on a, on a surface level, but the, re the repetition and the self-talk seem to me to be reflecting something just a shade different like an attempt to turn over a cold car in the dead of winter, could this psalmist be trying to jumpstart his own heart? Verse 35 stands out like a sore thumb. May sinners disappear from the earth and, and the wicked vanish. Now this could be a sweeping vision of judgment, but it seems to be a little bit out of place in the psalm. Um, the psalmists were all deeply aware of their own sin, and often they desperately reached out to God for forgiveness. You know what? One of the best ways, to, to, one of the best approaches to make sin vanish, sinners vanish from the earth, is to take sin away from the human heart. And that may be what the psalmist is suggesting, suggesting here. And that, well, that brings us back to verse 34, which I think captures the emotion of this psalm the best. May my thoughts be pleasing to him. May my thoughts be pleasing to him. Some translations read that as may my meditations be pleasing to him. But do you know what biblical meditation is? Biblical meditation is simply thinking. It's something that we all do. Most of us. Most of us, right? You're probably thinking right now. You're probably thinking, well, where is this guy going next? You're probably thinking about lunch. You're probably thinking, how much longer is this sermon can be? I know that because I'm thinking it too. <laughs> we all think it's just something we do. Biblical meditation is just focusing thoughts on something specific. The psalmist was thinking, how can I get those thoughts under control so that the garden of my heart and mind might exhibit the same kind of order and goodness that is found in creation. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord. How often do you think about what you think about? How often do you think about what you think about? It's hard for me sometimes to get a hold of my thoughts because I'm so often just caught or enraptured by a thought that I 
don't even know what I'm thinking about some of the time. Well, maybe for some of you, it's, it's, a, it's, a, lustful, it's a lustful look that has turned into an entrapping thought. Or perhaps it's a spirit of unforgiveness uh, that you just can't shake. Sometimes for me, I'll get stuck in an imagined conflict in my brain, in my mind, uh, arising from a fear and or insecurity that I just, that has no root in reality. I'll just imagine it and feel it from my own fears and insecurities. We all entertain wrong thoughts from time to time. But what about the seemingly innocuous thoughts that, that tend to take over too? When I was thinking about this, I couldn't help but think of the uh, former one-time pastor of Grace Chapel and who, who wrote extensively on this subject in, in Gordon MacDonald's book called Ordering Your Private World, and this is something that he said on the subject. There is a busyness that reflects a plan of activity, <clears throat> a pattern of priorities and a sense of purposefulness. It is a good and satisfying busyness through which one grows and increases competence. But there is also a busyness, a destructive busyness actually, that reflects a chaotic way of life, a way of doing in which one is simply responding to the next thing in the day. The next thing makes no difference whether it has significance. It's just the next thing. And one does it because, because it's there to do. It turns out that the garden that is our thought life can be invaded, not simply by intruders that have ill will, but, but also be so occupied with purposeless things that the life-giving things are, are left out. Praise, praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord. Can you hear the psalmist turning over the engine one more time, turning it over again, clearing out the intruders, planting seeds that, planting seeds that give life? God didn't just hold back chaos at creation. He repurposed it for order and good. He remade the oceans to travel, even play in for us and creatures. He made springs into trees where birds would live and give us music, fill the air with music. He gave springs for wine and for the making of bread, all for order, joy, and gladness and praise from the heart can, can bring us that order, joy, and gladness too. It brings peace on the inside because it, it draws our attention outward. It brings goodness to the soul by reflecting on him who is perfect. It secures belonging in our lonely selves with the realization that even our inner selves are not separated and unloved by the one who gave us the ability to think. It brings us gladness. It brings us gladness connecting us with the one who invented gladness. We praise the Lord so our souls can enjoy the same good and order joy found in God's creation. We praise the Lord so our souls can enjoy the same good and ordered joy found in God's creation. And now that's not the only reason we praise the Lord. But in this psalm, that's what the psalmist wants to leave us with. What would it feel like to have what sometimes seems like a thousand voices quiet down to one? What would it be like if all of those desires vying for attention in your spirit and in your soul took a back seat to a more wholehearted mode of existence, a a, a more liberated, liberated way of living. For some, this might feel like a big step. 
Perhaps there are big emotional and thought barriers at play keeping, keeping you from going there. I don't think that those feelings are foreign to the psalmist. Uh, perhaps there's some, there's some wisdom in taking some baby steps. So let me, just, let me just offer a few for you to meditate on, to think on. First, before talking to God, talk to you. Before talking to God, talk to you. I know that's grammatically correct, but it had more of a zing to it. Talk to you. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, the psalmist says. It's, it's, tempting, it's tempting to look at the past with contemporary bias. I don't think that people long ago had it easier than, than we had it or were less intelligent than we are, all of that kind of thing. At the same time, I think that we face different challenges than people of previous generations, uh, especially long ago, did. Uh, it, there, there are these are the tasks that we face. They, they present a special tax on the brain, tasks of commanding more systems, filtering more information out in our daily lives, and or simply managing more things. The busyness of our lives is only a shadow of what's going on here and here, right? As crazy as it might sound, I think that self-talk, like the psalmist exhibits here, can separate us from those thoughts so that we can actually know what we're thinking, so that we can know what we're thinking. And that's important because going through the motions and what we do, that's really going nowhere at all. Second, accept God's forgiveness for the thoughts that have gone astray. We have talked about this before. Chances are the person who is most likely to beat you up or make you feel bad is yourself. And really, just living in shame and guilt, it doesn't, it might suppress bad thoughts for a little bit, but it, ultimately those bad thoughts are going to be there. God sent his forgiveness into the world to bring healing to those thoughts. He sends his spirit into our lives to bring hope, healing, comfort. Now, don't get me wrong. The Holy Spirit also convicts, but, but guilt and shame is not the Holy Spirit's language. That's not the language that he speaks. He restores. He brings wholeness. He brings healing. He, he brings forgiveness. So take that in for yourself. Lastly, invite your soul to praise, then rinse and repeat. Invite your soul to praise, then rinse and repeat. Sometimes the car just doesn't start on the first try. I will sing to the Lord. I will, I will, I will sing praise to my God. May my thoughts be pleasing to him. I will rejoice. Praise the Lord on my soul. Praise the Lord. I got a hunch the psalmist wasn't just being poetic when he was repeating those words, he was pressing in. He was leaning a little bit further. He was refusing to give up. He was choosing to endure. And we can choose to endure too. We know as good and beautiful as the world can be, sin has entered into the world and, and broken things and made things not so good so when we look to the future, we look to a God who will one day make things right. We also lean into him now. We lean into him now so that our souls can become good and right when the world is not. We do it so that we can know God's gladness and order the inside of us when it is otherwise far from us. And we can experience more of that as we as we encourage our souls to praise. We praise the Lord so that our souls can enjoy the same good and ordered joy found in God's creation. So let's look to our God. Let's unlock those barriers inside of us and let's enjoy the good life, the good life that he gives by recognizing who he is and expressing his power his value and his worth.